morning， 大家翻嚟我哋下晝呢一個 session 啊。And、uh, for this section, we have invited Mr. Hans Kressinger from Germany. He is a director and has been doing documentary theatre for more than 20 years. Let's give him a big hand of round of applause. And your turn now. Yeah.、Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. And、uh, uh, I have to tell you, it's a great experience to be here. And、uh, the other thing I have to tell you,、uh, you see, if you do something for a long time. Sometimes, somehow, you survive it, and something is coming out of it. You just have to、uh, be stubborn and stand with the stuff you're interested in. It's、uh, from I. I'm trying to tell you a little bit、uh, about where I come from and what I'm doing. And、uh, the first thing I have to tell you is that nearly mostly all of my plays I do together with my with my wife Regina Dura. She's a documentary filmmaker, and we. Develops these plays together, and、uh, we,、uh, she is doing mostly the research, and we we develop it, we we construct it.、Uh, it's the base of of our work that we do. It's I want to tell you a little bit how I come to how I came to documentary theatre, because it had to do that I was working in uh, uh, in East Germany when it was still existing. I was、uh, working with Heiner Müller, and he was staging Hamlet, Hamlet Machine. And we had a time frame of rehearsals for eight months. So when we started, the GDR was still existing. When we came out, the GDR was gone. And it's very interesting to work in a time when the state situation around you dissolves, because the framework this performance was aiming at was gone.、Uh, there was another audience; people would not come to the theater any longer. And what to me was the most surprising thing was. That、uh, the text, which was really actually showing the situation in Heiner Müller's text *Hamlet Machine*, he was using this text as、uh, intercut for the staging of *Hamlet*. He was using his own translation.、Um, this was the most difficult part to rehearse because there was the lines in the in the play where he says,、uh, "The uprising starts as a stroll against the traffic rules." And this was exactly how the uprising started in the GDR, how the movement started. And Heine Müller in these days was very active in、uh, in, the, in the people's movement. There was a big demonstration on the fourth of November in、uh, 1989, where、uh, he would give because it's very interesting. I think in the documentary theater we give voice, we give voice to、uh, to people who otherwise are not heard,、uh, and sometimes we give voice to people. Who don't want to be heard, and we make it public again because we present it in the theater. And what he was doing there, he was not delivering a text of his own. He was reading a text from a group of workers. What they think, what was happening in the GDR, and what they were expectations, what their expectations were about what would be happening in the、uh, in the upcoming future in the new Germany. Uh, the most radical thing you could say about this performance was that it took eight hours, and eight hours to take eight hours out of the lifetime of the audience、uh, in these times is a lot of a lot of time you take. It's a really challenge what you take, and somehow it was uh, the uh, the staging was like the funeral of the GDR. And one of the、uh, one of the actors was describing it.、Uh, Ulrich Müller. He was playing. He was playing Hamlet.、Um, he said, "Of course, I had a lot of privileges in the GDR. I could travel. I could do things what other people could not do. But when I was on the stage, I knew that I could do things on the stage, and I could talk about things on the stage nobody else could talk about. And there was a frame in the in the audience that they could read." What he was talking about, and he could say, and now the situation has changed in this new Germany, which was there after March 1999.、Uh, we opened in March 1990,、uh, and、uh, he was describing it. Said, in the old days, his audience would sit. I can show you. They would sit on the top of the chair, and they would listen. And when he would make a pause in a classical text, they would refer to this pause. Because they would refer to the sentence, and they would make a transformation into the situation of the GDR. And suddenly, in March, the theaters were empty. And in April, there was a new crowd coming, and this new crowd was sitting in the theater like that. 
Okay. Do something. Show me what you can do. I was thinking a little bit about this when Robin was uh, talking today this morning. And uh, Ulrich said, it's very difficult for an actor to go on performing when your reference frame is disappearing. If people can no longer read what you're doing on the stage, and if you can't communicate with society because they cannot, uh, uh, they don't know what you're talking about, what you're trying to communicate. And so a lot of these actors, uh, these brilliant actors from the GDR, they, they made a stop. They made a stop with uh, performing on the stage. They, uh, well, they went into television or in film work or so, but they never performed in some of them. They took a break for a year or uh, some even longer, as they would not perform on the stage and see what was going on. And for me it was after Hammond Machine, because it was really a mind-changing experience, also, I studied in, uh, in Gießen, in the uh, uh, famous school for applied theatre sciences. Uh, I have a very classical background. My interest in the theatre was in classical plays, in the structure of language, in the quality of, uh, of verse, of uh, what is inside a play. I was fascinated by plays. And, but after the experience, when uh, state is solved, uh, somehow it didn't feel enough to just do plays. And so I took a break and then, uh, but I was always interested in history. And uh, by accident, uh, a subject hit me. It came back and I developed a play about uh, Adolf Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann was the guy who was in charge of the uh, Endlösung, uh, of the question of the Jews. He was responsible for the transport to, uh, to Auschwitz. And he was uh, undercover in Argentina and the Israelis, uh, the Mossad, they took him in, uh, in Argentina and they brought him on a plane to, um, to Israel and they made a trial. And maybe just one detail, because I think it's always important to have these, to have these details in the life of Eichmann. Um, because the Mossad, the agents, were not quite sure if uh, it was really Eichmann, because they expected the guy who was, he must have been well off because he, uh, uh, he got a lot of money for himself when he was uh, working for the SS. And he was working for a German factory in Argentina and he was living in a very poor neighborhood. And so they were observing him, and, but they were not sure if it was Eichmann or if it was someone else. And then one day, this, and he was living together with uh, the wife of Adolf Eichmann, which was called Vera Liebel, but they were not sure if this was really Eichmann, because he even looked different. He, uh, there was no picture of him around after the, after the war. And this guy, which they saw coming with, uh, with a streetcar and with a bus going to this small apartment, this didn't look like this somewhat impressive Adolf Eichmann who was there. And so one day this guy came with, uh, with a big bunch of flowers and really expensive flowers. And they thought, this is strange. Why is he coming with this big uh, basket of flowers? It was not Vera Liebel's uh, birthday. It was not his birthday. It was not his children's birthday. And they did some research. It's always good to do research. And they found out it was their wedding day. It was the wedding day of Adolf Eichmann and Vera Liebel. And this was a point when uh, the Mossad decided, uh, this must be Eichmann, let's go and get him. And they caught him. And they brought him to, uh, to Israel and there was a trial. And before the trial, of course, there was an interrogation. And in the interrogation, um, he had the face of an uh, interrogation officer. His name is Afner Les, was Afner Les. And Afner Les was a, a German Jew who grew up in Berlin. And he was, at this time, the best uh, intelligence officer uh, the Mossad had. And he was assigned by his chief to do, the, uh, to do the interrogation, but he didn't want to do it. Because he said, my father was one on, uh, on the last transports to Auschwitz, and Eichmann is responsible for that, and I don't want to, to interrogate this guy, I don't want to sit opposite of him for half a year. But of course, he had to do it, so he did it. And what is interesting, when, uh, because I got through a friend, I got the original transcript of the, um, of the interrogation. And this original transcript is about 3,600 pages. 
And on every page, Eichmann had a sign that uh, what is standing there, it's right. So it's in German and it's in Hebrew. And uh, we, I thought that this is a very good uh, thing to use for a play. Because it tells you something. And the interrogation, what was interesting to me in the interrogation was that Eichmann uh, in the beginning, and uh, he never spoke about the killings, uh, about uh, executions or so. He did not do that. He spoke about problems. And problems he had to solve. And he spoke about the disagreements he had with the uh, German army because uh, they needed the trains and he needed the trains. They needed the trains for soldiers, he needed for the Jews. And, but he was not talking about the killings. And he was lying at the beginning all the time. And when you go through the transcript, what is very interesting is that you see that there is a, a, there is a point where Afna Les realizes that, of course, Eichmann is lying because he's talking about his life. Um, but that he has to encounter somehow this logic Eichmann has. And Eichmann has a logic of solving problems. That the human beings disappear behind the language. And that's very interesting about this material. And then there is a switch, and you can really see it when you go through the script in the head of Les, because Les decides if I want to get information out of this guy, I have to stick to his logic. I have to adjust to adapt somehow to his language, to this way he is describing the problems. And then he's doing it. And that's a trick. And suddenly Eichmann starts talking. Suddenly Eichmann starts giving information. And what I found quite interesting was the situation that Eichmann was seeing this guy for almost half a year, well, almost every second or third day, and they would talk, and Eichmann would not see anybody else. So there is a relationship between these two human beings. You can't avoid that if you have this situation. And I thought and that's a very good material for, uh, for working on a play. And uh, I came up with the idea that uh, I would like to do a play which is called Questions and Answers. So, Q&A. And as a Q&A play, we, uh, uh, we created a situation that the audience would see a play in three different spaces. So, uh, maybe I can, uh, I can describe you uh, an image. You can see there is a very big table. And on the one hand of the side, you see an actor. Uh, and on the other side you see the other actor, and there is 34 ch chairs around at the table. And it's a, it's a rehearsal photo, because I'm not very good at documentation my art and my, uh, my work, so we only have a few photographs of the early pieces. It's, uh, and they do, this, they do this talk, they perform the interrogation, and the audience is sitting together with them at the table. And there is a camera, you can see there is a mic in front of them. And so, what they talk into the mic, it's transferred to another space. And in this other space, you have again 34 people. And there is just a light bulb hanging, they're sitting on a very small table. And they listen to the interrogation. They listen to the stuff which is going on, the talk which is going on between the, uh, between the two actors. And there is another room, the third space, and in the third space, um, they can have, uh, you have two monitors. Now, there's two monitors, you see uh, the actor playing Eichmann and the actor playing Les. And you see documentary footage. And if you have a closer look to the images, the guy in the middle, he looks a little bit like Eichmann. He's dressed like him. And in this uh, space, you only see the documentary footage and you just see the actors, but you don't hear what they talk. You get all these informations which is broadcasted over the television or uh, we got material from Israeli television, from German television, from uh, uh, English television, and we did interviews with people who took part in the, uh, in the, in the trial. And if you don't pay attention, you say, oh, this guy must be Ashman. But you're wrong. Because this guy is playing the interrogation officer. He's just dressed like Eichmann. And when you pay attention, and when you pay attention to the body language, you can very clearly see who is leading an interrogation and who is the guy who is asked. But 
most of the people don't pay attention. So what is happening is for all the three people, all the three groups who see the show, the show starts at the same time. And then for one group, the show starts with, uh, they sit together with the actors, then they go to the next room, they just have the voice, and in the end they just have the image. This group was, a lot of times, was really disappointed with the performance because it takes the presence of the actors away. Which is really interesting uh, to learn something about the basic of theatre. It's about the presence of people in the space, I think. And the second group, they start with the listening, the voices, then they go to the actors, and then they have the documentary footage, so it's like a full package, and you get the information, and you experience something, and so on, you feel well. So the last group was really interesting, because the last group, they start with the documentary footage, and you see the power of the image. And they saw this guy who's dressed like Eichmann, then in the next space they go, and then they hear the voices, they sit on the small tables, and you can see from the, from the frame we did for the camera, that it looks like a very close, uh, that these guys sitting opposite one another. And you were sitting in the second space, you were sitting on a small table. You were listening, and you think, okay, these actors sit on a small table on the stage and I can watch them. And then you come in the last space, and in the last space, you have this big table, and you have this guy dressed like Eichmann, and you have the other guy. And it's very interesting about the human being, uh, you always want to be on the good side, you want to sit with the nice people. So the chairs close to the guy uh, who is dressed like, uh, well, your famous grandpa, they were immediately occupied. And the last chairs which were taken were the chairs around the guy who looks like Eichmann. And then the third section starts, and then you feel very uncomfortable because you are sitting here, and here is the actor playing Eichmann. And when he is dealing with documents, he is passing out the document and is lying right in front of you. And so it's a frame and the rule we had for this performance was that we said uh, the groups would not meet. So everybody is in the same performance or the same evening, but actually you have three different performances. And uh, we performed it several times. And a lot of times we had people coming back because they wanted to go on the other trip to experience the other show. And they really called it the other show. Because depending on in which situation you saw the material, you encountered the material, you saw another show. It's a very different experience you had with the same subject. And uh, may I can tell you a little bit more about another another performance? Yeah. Because This is a play, uh, two friends of ours, uh, Olaf Art and Rob Mond, did an installation for uh, uh, ZKM, Center for Media Technology, about uh, the camera see lens. The camera see lens is a place where you, uh, uh, where you hear nothing. And it's a very frightening space because uh, you go inside and suddenly you hear, there is no su there is not such thing as silence. Because every movement produces an enormous amount of sound when you are in this dead chamber. And what is even more frightening is that uh, uh, your voice sounds different. Because you're very familiar with the sound of your voice. And suddenly in a space like this, your voice is like an alien to you. Because you hear yourself, it's taking the resonance away. And it's, really, it's, it's not nice. It's just not a nice space. And so they, uh, they asked us, if you could come up with the idea of developing a theater play for this space. And then uh, we decided very quickly about the subject. The subject was that we would do something about isolation prison. And then Rudin has a brilliant idea that uh, because the camera C lens is, uh, is there, and the camera C lens is uh, it's like a box. It's like a six by six meter box. And as you can see, you have an eye right there, you have a view inside the box. And you see, you have an actress sitting inside, and there is a very famous letter from uh, Ulrike also. There is a very famous letter from Ulrike Meinhof, where she is describing her time in the isolation prison in Cologne. And it's a letter uh, where she was a very good journalist, a very good writer, and it's a letter where she describes what is happening towards her, what is happening towards her body. 
And she says, being in this uh, situation of isolation, it's like, uh, it's a feeling that your head explodes. It's a feeling that they tear your skin off. It's a feeling that they hit you in the stomach without hitting you. And she's describing this very well. And this discussion, this, uh, the, uh, the conditions of people from the Red Army Fraction were in, uh, in prisons in Germany in the 1970s, uh, brought a lot of other people to join the terrorist movement. This third generation is a direct response to the uh, prison conditions of, of these people. Uh, Fassbinder made a film about this, which is quite interesting. If you haven't seen this, I can recommend this, the third generation. It's, uh, and then, as you can see, we have the actress. And this actress was an uh, actress. Uh, we worked in, we rehearsed in a space where we had the real condition. And uh, you can rehearse in this kind of space only for 90 minutes or so, then you have to have a break. Because it's very tiring, it's very, uh, it's very exhausting to be in this kind of situation. And Barbara, Barbara was her name, Barbara always said that uh, mostly after 50, 55 minutes, um, uh, Hans, can you please uh, take out the Gregorian, the Gregorian chants? And I said, Barbara, sorry, we don't play the Gregorian chants, we don't play anything to the... Yeah, but I can hear them. And then you have to take a break because what was interesting about this was that your mind is not constructed that there is nothing around you. So you always come up with something. And what is interesting about the situation of the people from the Red Army faction was that um, of course the government knew that these people uh, have a lot of energy. And if this energy is going nowhere, this energy is going inside. It's fighting against you. And so it was the only time when the, uh, the Federal Republic of Germany was in the papers of Amnesty International and it was not nice what was said in the papers. So, and as I, as I said, maybe we can, we can see the other picture again. It's, it's, Regina had this idea that we would, uh, we constructed two, uh, two spaces for the audience. So if this is a box with, uh, uh, how you say, with, uh, with the actress inside, and then we had a space constructed for the audience, a white box on the left side, and a box, a white box on the right side. And in this space, there would be 25 people, 25 female audience members, and 25 male members. And so we would separate the couples when they come and we would have immediately the first discussion before the show starts. Because a lot of people say, no, I come to the show together with my husband, I don't want to be alone. So we say, well, you can only see it in the female department, otherwise you have to go, we're sorry. So we were very strict about that. And the show lasted only for 40 minutes. But what was happening then was, as you can see, we had a big projection of the actress inside the box. And we had a small monitor where you see a tiger running in a cage because the uh, uh, Red Army faction called this type of prison tiger cages. This was the name of the, of the Red Army, as they called it. Now on the other side, you could see an actor and he would talk to you about the, uh, the concept of the isolation of the senses of people who are in prison if you want to bring them back to society. What is happening then? And what was really nice was uh, we had another monitor, you can't see it, because it was on top of the, uh, of the space, where the female audience could look into the male audience space, and the male audience could look into the female audience space. And after a while, after these 40 minutes, you were asking yourself, what is real? Is the actress really there? Or do you see just something which is taped and which is played? And the actress was there all the time. But you were not sure about it. Because, of course, there was a big discussion in the German society about, uh, about these conditions of, uh, of the people who are in prison. Is it right to do that? Is it not right to do this? What consequences it has? How you deal with citizens? So it was a lot of, a lot of stuff going on around it. And maybe, shall we, shall we have a look on another? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Because uh, maybe now we do a big jump. 
It's really it's like a tiger's jump from the tiger cage. And uh, I want to show you something, a trailer from a, a show we did, uh, which is called Frontex, Frontex Security. Uh, as I told you, okay, five minutes left, I'll try. Anfang der 1980er Jahre entwickelte sich eine europäische Tendenz, Migration als ein Problem zu betrachten und ihr eine gemeinsame Lösung entgegenzusetzen. Sehen Sie, Zäune sind keine Lösung. Ja, wenn die Menschen kommen wollen, dann schaffen sie das auch. Wir können sie ja schließlich nicht erschießen. Ja. Wenn ein Flüchtling sagt, er beantrage Asyl, dann darf er an der Grenze nicht zurückgeschickt werden. Zu erleben. Es gibt zwei Auffanglager auf Lampedusa. Das große im Osten, von Prada in Jakoka, und das kleine im Westen, eine ehemalige Militärbasis. Laut Aussage des italienischen Flüchtlingsrates CDR, Consiglio Italiano per i Refugiati, bieten sie insgesamt knapp 400 Betten an. The approach is a very important. To carry statement, to shield the target water from wind and waves by approaching the broadside. This is done one by one. Ich, ich bin entsetzt über das Schweigen von Europa. Das 2012 den Friedensnobelpreis erhält und nichts sagt. Frau oh, Nicolini ist grün. Er fasst uns los, weil es eine große Dummheit ist, zu glauben, dass man Immigration stoppen könnte oder müsse. Migration ist normal, hat es immer gegeben bei Vögeln, bei Wahlen, bei Menschen. Tiere verlassen eine Region, wenn sie nicht mehr überleben können. Aber so ein Mensch lässt es auch tun. Because Frontex, we, we did a play about Somalia, 
And uh, we had an, uh, during the research about Somalia, uh, Regina found this case of Frontex. And Frontex is a very interesting agency, European agency, who has a lot of money for uh, the protection of the European borders. Everybody knows that it will not work, but the uh, budget is rising every year. They started with 40 people in Warsaw, and now they with a budget of 40 millions. And now they have a budget about uh, 300 people, and they have about 500 million. And their budget is going up like, uh, if you would be on the stock exchange, you would really have to invest in this company. It's, uh, and what we, we tried to, uh, and Regine said, what, uh, let's, let's not use this material for, um, for the Somalia play. Let's do a play just about this agency. And we tried to get in contact with the agency and, uh, in 2013, they were not very open. They didn't respond. So we said, okay, but we do the play about them. Let's get every uh, information around about them, which is available. And so we got internal papers from Frontex. We got press interviews they did. We got uh, papers from the European Council. We collected everything what we could have. And so the first part of the show, uh, the audience is sitting in the theater, just as it is. And we use all this material from Frontex, which is around. And uh, they, the four actors, they perform as if they are members of the agency. And then this moment you saw when they asked what you, uh, what do you think, what will happen when we open the borders, uh, there is a change. Then we lead the people up on the stage, and in the stage you are suddenly on Lampedusa. And all this material, when you sit in this in this box in this cage, is related to Lampedusa, the island where most of the refugees from Africa arrive. And uh, we had an interview with, uh, with the mayor of Lampedusa, uh, which Sina was performing. And uh, so we put the audience in a situation that they are on the island. And then we go into the cases. And in the cases, and the cases are quite terrible, what is happening. Uh, there was uh, sometimes, um, sounds a little bit crazy to say it, but uh, two weeks before we opened, there was this big accident where 400 people died. They drowned in front of Lampedusa. And so, of course, there was a lot of media interest in our show. So, and the uh, show was, uh, how do you say, very, very received, and it was sold out all the time, and so it was, uh, how do you say, successful performance. So you had the, um, we toured this show a lot, to, to festivals and so And there were these moments where the opera singer was singing, because the musician we work with, um, he is part of the team right from the beginning, and he is doing music for almost all our pieces. Uh, he looked, because in Europe you have this idea that we have the highest standards and the highest standards of uh, European culture is the opera. And there are only two operas who deal with the question of asylum. And so he took two famous areas. Yeah. I, uh, I tried to. <laughs> uh, he took these areas and we used them as a disturbance to the material. So there are several moments where the opera singer appears, and in the beginning she is singing it very beautiful as it is composed, and during the performance she is deconstructing it more and more. And in the end it's just, uh, she's just singing notes, and you can't, you have no reference to the stuff from the beginning. So it's about, uh, taking things out of the order. So that's what we try to do. It's, um, well, if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer. And uh, you can ask anything about production situation or so, and just, just what is useful for you. And so, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So now we'll open the floor for a question. So if anyone want to ask anything, about the production method? Yeah, yes. Oh, wait, just for a second. Yeah, the, the mic is coming. Thank you. I was wondering, how do you develop your pieces? Is it a commission? Or is it a commission piece, for example? Or is it that you come up with a topic like 
a political issue like refugee cr uh, crisis, for example, or the piece about uh, Rwanda you did, or uh, about uh, the war on the uh, in, um, uh, on the Balkan. Uh, so, do you find these topics and develop kind of draft of what you want to? Uh, present uh, in this piece, or is it uh, that a theater like Karlsruhe, for example, with whom you are collaborating very often, or Gorky, who are also very well known for their very political point of view uh, on theater, is is it that they kind of ask you, would you do a piece about refugee crisis, would you do a piece about Greece? Uh, how? It goes for example, for, uh, with the Frontex play, we were in a very lucky situation that we had funding from the city of Berlin, from the government, which commissioned us that we would do, we got uh, about 100,000 euro a year, and uh, we had a contract with the uh, with Hamburg, with the Habit Center, which says that uh, they would, uh, we have to present one show a year there, and then they give the rest of the budget, and uh, we have to do six to eight performances there. This was the contract we had. But then we had a new jury now, and so the new jury said these people are so successful with the theater trap, and now they don't need this funding any longer, so they cut our funding. <laughs> so, which is a little bit crazy because uh, uh, it's not so easy. But on so the other this, hand, of course, this theater was your co producer in a way? Okay. So I was I a co producer. See. But on the other hand, of course, we have uh, the situation I will describe with Castro, with Max and Gorky, mm -hmm. uh, because we do this stuff since a very long time, and so yeah. we are kind of specialists. And so if the theater is getting interested in things which are difficult, mm -hmm. uh, we are specialists for difficult things. Mm -hmm. So uh, they ask me if these people can turn it into a play. Mm -hmm. And then we have to think, we have to sit together, we discuss if it's interesting for us, if we can do it, if we want to do it. Because it takes a lot of our lifetime when we do this, this kind of stuff. And uh, then sometimes we do it and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do research and uh, it doesn't turn into a play. Mm -hmm. Because you can't manage to, uh, that you don't find the clue. And sometimes you don't get the funding. So it, you try to do your work and pay your rent. That's what it's all about. And uh, the second question, if I may Did you ever work with non professional actors? No, I would not do that. I would never do that. Because uh, that was, I like the people from Brimley Protocol very much, and I think their approach is quite, uh, for them, it's real. But it's this. Uh, this Experts of everyday life, they are the kind of, how you say, uh, they give this profoundness to the performance, what they do. But Regina and I, we are interested in a different thing. We are interested in the language, how things are described, how people construct meaning, how things are delivered, what is in archives. And the only thing, I totally agree with Robin, there is a, a professional skill of an actor, because he can analyze a text when he is speaking it and you have an experience with it. And most of these texts are really difficult. For example, what, these, uh, what the four people were doing there, these four are very good actors. Uh, Zina is just going to the sheep at a country with the Berlin Ensemble now, who's a new sheep. And Armin is a, he did a lot of television work. So they're all of them, and they have the ability to analyze it when they speak it. And so you have another encounter with it. You have another chance to experience it. Because it's, these texts are quite complicated. And it takes, uh, you have to have a profound knowledge of your skills, what you do, that you present it. Because it looks very easy. But this uh, thing, what they talk about in the beginning, it took us a while until we understood what they were talking about. Because it's internal papers of Frontex. And they have a lot of, uh, the sequence is not in the, in the trailer because uh, we try, uh, we thought then uh, our producers would uh, get anxious. There is one sequence because a lot of Frontex papers they just work with this um, cursor. What's that? Cursor. Abbreviation. Yeah. Abbreviation. Uh, abbreviations. So you can. Yeah, acronyms. And you have a page where it's just exchanging all these things, and you have no clue what is going on. And the actors do it, and it sounds, it seems very natural. And when you see the actors doing it, and it looks so natural, you understand. That it's, it's a kind of language which is avoiding the issue. When I was talking about the Eichmann play in the beginning, that there is a distance between you and the subject, and this distance is a language. And so, for the work we do, we need professional actors. We need actors who are willing to, uh, well, who love to read and who love to take a risk. 
because a lot of times not everybody likes this kind of show. That's what we do. Okay, yes? Hi, uh, just want to know, is scenography a huge element in your work? Because when I saw the photos of your productions, these are really strikingly visceral images. So I just wonder, and also do you, how, do, how would you think that scenography can perform documentary theater? But scenography is very important for the, for the whole issue here because it, scenography you create space. So right from the beginning we involve the, the set designer. We have, we have two set designers we regularly work with, uh, Valerie and Rob. And uh, Rob is a visual artist. You can, you can see this very strongly in the, in the stuff he's doing. And uh, of course we sit with him together. The first thing before we do, uh, well, do along the research, we talk about uh, uh, the concept of the spaces, how we develop the spaces. And a lot of it is done uh, regarding to the process when we decide what is going in and what is going on. And a lot of times we create special situations, space situations for the audience. So that the audience has to move. Just this concept of the audience has to stand up and move is a big thing. It sounds very ridiculous when you say it, but it's a big thing when you change your position. Because it's a physical act. It's watching this, you're sitting in the theater chair and you watch these people from the, the actors playing the front of the agency and it's all very relaxed and all very easy and charming and everything. And suddenly they ask you at the end of the show, yeah, but what do you think was the first part? What do you think what will happen when we open the borders? And then the lights in the house go on and you have to move on the stage and you sit on the stage. And on the stage you sit, on a, you sit in a cage and the audience is sitting in a kind of you and the actors are very close to you, so they move between you. You see these little chips, and you see this, um, you say that the bones are sinking. And it's, I mean, it's just a toy. They, they build this, and there's more and more chips, and it's very playful, and it's very delightful somehow. But you have just heard the text, and it splits through all the four actors what is describing to the human body if you drown. And what is interesting is that uh, it takes longer for a child to die when you drown. Because the heart of a child is stronger. So uh, it takes longer for him until he stands. And what is interesting, what is also happening when you drown, is that uh, because your brain doesn't understand what's going on, so the, uh, the system, the body system, is still working. It's pushing all the energy inside, but it's going nowhere. And it can, uh, to drown is a very terrible death. When you, uh, we spoke with the doctor and uh, we got this from this book about uh, what is happening. Uh, you have a very different relationship uh, to Hamlet with Ophelia who drowns, and you know what drowning is all about. So that's what we do. But yes, the scenography is really important. Yes, any other question? Should I ask? You can ask. Oh, is it okay? Because <laughs> uh, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, attend uh, Hans' workshop in Beijing earlier this month. And we also share a lot, because at the moment we are rehearsing three shows uh, the coming month. The three new emerging artists, they're working on their own piece. And then we did ask lots of questions about how to work with text. And um, my it's very general question is like following the question that I asked earlier, when we work with different kind of texts, like for example, there are texts about um, acad academia and we have statistics and the text is so, so different. And unlike uh, verbatim theatre, mainly on people's word, they are also based on heavily on text and language, but your idea of language is different from it's very different. So I'm just wondering what is your, um, uh, like for example, what with those diverse texts, what are the tactics that you often employ? Like for example, you use songs that to, 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 uh, to represent the deconstruction of the whole thing. Like I'm just wondering other theatrical tactics that you use with different texts. Well, for example, this, uh, this song, the other song, the nice song, which you hear in the, in the Frontex trailer, is a very famous uh, German uh, song from the 50s. 
uh, go on vacation to Italy. So, and the older generations are all now, and it's still very popular. And it's this thing, uh, well, what uh, Rodin and I are doing when we work with taxes. Uh, we, uh, well, every text has an intention. In every text, there is uh, an experience. And every text, especially in statistics, there is a lot of information behind the statistics. So it tells you a lot about what is going on in society. So we have a very simple approach to this text. We take every text very serious and we don't change it. And so what we do is we try to confront the texts with each other. Because with yesterday I was talking about this idea of the field, that uh, in, the, in the field, uh, if you have a lot of different sources from text, you, um, you create a tension, you create a conflict. And so uh, our basic strategy with text is work, work, work. Oh, just a second, like better with mic, yeah, so the people at the back can hear it. Yeah. Seems almost just using that. It seems almost that like you're using texture very much. That you're using what you do is a texture, and you're using installation. Where does narrative sit in that? Where is the beginning, the middle, and end of your play? How do you make those decisions doing the plays you do? That's what I'm very curious about. It's, um, it's a very good question, how you would describe that. Um, there is different strategies regarding to the, to the topic we use. For example, uh, we did a play about uh, uh, the Herero War, the war, the German war against the Herero, the first genocide in the 20th century. And there Regina found a text uh, which was, it was the first time that the German army had to, uh, how you say, had to explain uh, what they were doing to the German public. So there was a German officer, he was going to uh, 35 different German cities and he was doing a slideshow in 1909 and he was describing what was happening in Africa and so we used this text as a, as a backbone to, uh, to the performance so it had a very clear narrative and we intercut it with other materials with, uh, with Frontex we had, uh, we had a different strategy with Frontex we said uh, we collect uh, uh, the materials which what is Frontex saying in the first part what are they talking about themselves? And in the second part, we go to one special location, we go to Lampedusa, and see what impact it has on the island. So it's, you could say, uh, every, every subject creates a different, different strategy. And uh, sometimes we cut the play, it could go longer. It could, it could continue. But uh, then we just make the cut. It's like uh, as if you, if you would do a cut in a film. For example, in the end of Frontex, uh, we used a very old poem from the 18th century, which is very beautiful, where uh, uh, the author is describing a catastrophe where a ship is sinking. And he's describing it in all emotions and in all details. And in the last line he says, um, but nothing happened to me because I was just standing at the shore and I was watching. And then it's all. And that's what's happening in Europe right now. We're standing at the shore and we're watching. So does that happen in all your plays? That, that there is a beginning, a middle and an end? In the Eichmann play, for instance, that seems to me that there were different textures for the three different audiences. And that was your aim in a way. In all the work I've always done, there's always been a a play, a scene beyond which I could not go. There's always been an end, like you saw the end of the Nuremberg play, you couldn't do a scene after that short cross speech in the same way as when the boys give testimony in the Lawrence play. That has to be the last scene. Is, do you have the same situation in the Eichmann play or do you do more, I understand with the Frontex you found a solution 
that gave you the final scene, but sometimes you do plays that don't have a final scene, and you decide that's where you're going to cut it. But where is your middle, and where's your beginning? Well, the try to cut it in a moment where there is a surprise. For example, in this play we did about the Rwandan genocide, we have a very, uh, it's a very brutal scene which is describing the remains of the massacres. And then we go to, uh, because the same region where there is this film, Gorillas in the Mist, with Sigourney Viva is playing. And uh, then we do, a, after this description, we do a cut, and the actors uh, switch in the models of a talk show, and they suddenly talk about uh, the terrible situation of the gorillas in, uh, in the Congo and in Rwanda. And, uh, uh, but wasn't this beautiful performance of Sigourney Viva in Gorillas in the Mist? Oh yeah, she got an Oscar for this, didn't she? And suddenly it's all. So we try to uh, uh, we try to have a surprise, and sometimes it's from the logic of the space it creates uh, uh, the framing of the text. Because of course, when you decide that the audience has to move, uh, then it's difficult if you want to go to uh, to a text element which you have already dealt with in another situation in the space. So it's it's a balance. It's, it's a very complicated mixture, and it, it doesn't work out all the time. And um, what, was the, what was the end of the Eichmann production? Well, at the end of the Eichmann production, uh, the actors just left. Because, of course, uh, we couldn't present the 3,600 pages. We, uh, we made, uh, we had to each, uh, to each part was, uh, uh, how you say, the central scene was assigned. And then in the end, I liked this very much that uh, actors on the big table, uh, they just stood up and left. And so in the, when you were sitting in the, uh, in the space where you would hear the actors, you would only hear the sound of the audience. And in the film, in the part with the documentary footage, the documentary footage would still play on, would just continue. But the actors won't be there. But after every show, we have a session where uh, we meet with the audience. In the Eichmann show, we did like this. So it's like a 20 minute break, and then the, uh, the audience can have an encounter with the actors. And we talk about what they experience, what they, what they do, if they are willing to do so. Um, last question? Yes. Share with us a bit, little bit more about the music elements in the um, works that you have done before. Is um, every time you did uh, your work, music is a very important element. How will you work with the um, the musicians uh, from the very beginning of the work, or in what time that you will involve them? Well, well Daniel, our musician Daniel Dosh, he is uh, he's involved right from the beginning. When we, uh, when we when we talk about the issue, and he's very busy because he's performing also in, in other in other theaters as well. Uh, we uh, we give him the material we research on, and then he is doing his own research in a musical way. What kind of music could be related to it? Uh, for example, uh, in this production we had in Beijing uh, about uh, the stumble stones, the tripping stones. Uh, he came up with the idea that, of course, because it's a stone, and a stone produces sound when it falls, when you put it next to another stone. Uh, and he was creating a kind of musical storm with the element with the sound of stones, which is going on through the whole performance. Of course, there are also other musical elements. We, uh, we try to work not with too many uh, musical different things. That the music also has a, it's like a frame, it's like another frame. So space is a frame and the music is a frame. And we try to have it on as many different layers as possible. So music elements to you is kind of like another language? Well, it's, you know, it's part yeah. of the language of the performance. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very important language because music, it's, music can be very, it can become very emotional. It can be, and it's like a, it can also be like a frame, uh, like an element uh, for structuring the, uh, the speaking of the actors. So it is creating another rhythm, which is a counter rhythm for the, for the way they deliver their lines. 
It's a, on some levels, it's a very formal approach what we do. It's, uh, and music is a very important tool in doing that. Okay, any other? Oh, yes. Really the last, last question. Okay. Actually, this is uh, more of an observation. So you began your talk by talking about Hamlet Machine, which is um, very, very fragmented for, uh, and other things as well. But it seems that, um, that your, the path of your work, in a certain sense, takes up that idea of fragmentation and uses it and keeps exploring it in different ways. And it's just yes or no, it's an observation. You can say so, yes, because I spent a lot of my lifetime with Hamlet Machine. I did it together with Robert Wilson in New York. We, Heine Müller, staged it with us in, uh, in Gießen in the department. It's probably one of the most influential texts on me. And I think it's one of the best texts which, uh, which Müller has written. Because it's really, it's, uh, it's a response to Hamlet. And it's not only a response to Hamlet, it's a response to European history in the 20th century. And, and so it's... Correct me if I'm wrong, I, I've only seen it on film, but there is an opera singer in it. In the, in the, in the staging of, uh, of Robert Wilson, there is Jesse Norman was singing the dwarf ah, in the that's, that's Robert Wilson's But Müller is right. using this, this, this term for the third part, he is uh, using this frame castle. Okay. And because he's dealing with this five act structure of Hamlet in, in the Hamlet machine. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. This is the end of today's presentation. Let's give a big hand for us. <laughs> presentation of his idea of documentary theatre and after oh, we have uh, around 20 minutes of break time and after that we'll, be, we'll come to our last section of a round table with all our guests and also a conclusion of these two days discussion and also a, a, a projection of how documentary theatre could develop in the future so we hope to see you again in 20 minutes.